In the summer of 1985, 11-year-old Jesse Morgan and his friends were playing a game similar to hide-and-seek in Bear Brook State Park located in their hometown of Allenstown, New Hampshire. One of the boys called out to the others, revealing his hiding place because he'd found something more exciting than their game. It was a slightly rusted, dark blue, 55-gallon steel barrel with a piece of plastic poking up beneath the lid. They managed to slightly loosen the lid, releasing an odor that resembled spoiled milk. When they were unable to open the lid all the way, one of the boys kicked the side of the barrel, knocking it over to its side. A white liquid trickled out. Again, Jesse and his friends mistook this for rotten milk, and they went home, leaving the barrel in the woods. In November 1985, Officer Ron Montpleiser of the Allenstown Police Department received a call from a hunter who believed he had found a barrel containing a dead body. Montpleiser was used to dealing with typical small-town callouts, so at first he thought it was more likely that a deceased pet or deer carcass had been dumped. But upon looking inside the barrel, he found himself face-to-face -face with a decomposed human skull. Montplacher was the only police officer on duty, which was normal for Allenstown, so he called in the other members of the force and deputized locals to secure the area. Jesse Morgan's father was deputized, and with shock, the Morgan family realized it was the same barrel Jesse and his friends played with a few months earlier. And so began a mystery that would span over three decades. Before I get into this video, I want to take a moment to credit and shout out Bear Brook a podcast hosted by Jason Moon and produced by New Hampshire Public Radio. A lot of information in this video was sourced from there. It's an excellent investigative podcast. If you want to hear more about the case after this video, it's on Spotify and most other podcast platforms. They break down each aspect of the case in detail, and there's a second season exploring a new mystery coming later this year. I recommend it if you're interested in true crime. I'll leave a link to their website in the description. I also want to shout out Justine Perry for helping me put together this script and all of this information. She was very, very helpful and I truly appreciate her. If you want to show her some love, you can find links to her other work in the description. Now, let's get into this video. The barrel contained the remains of a woman and a female child. The remains were nude, dismembered, and decomposed to the point that they were partly skeletonized. The bodies were wrapped in plastic and tied with electrical wire. They had possibly been dismembered to fit inside the barrel. The cause of the death for both victims was blunt force trauma to the head. Investigators estimated the bodies had been in the barrel for anything from a few months to several years. The woman was thought to be in her 20s or early 30s at the time of her death and the girl between 8 to 10 years old. The New Hampshire State Police took charge of the investigation while the Allenstown Police continued to canvass for information locally. Back then, there wasn't the level of forensic examination we have these days. The victims were thought to potentially be mother and daughter, so investigators tried to match them to missing mother-daughter reports. Campground records in the Bear Brook area were checked, and detectives also tried to find a match in the FBI's database of dental records. However, any leads turned out to be dead ends. In 1986, the first composite sketches of the victims were released. The decomposed state of the victims' remains meant there wasn't much to go on, but the sketches were based on the victims' hair, bone, and teeth structure. This gave the public some idea of what the victims might have looked like, but unfortunately, this didn't really lead to any new information. The bodies were released for burial in 1987, the victims were buried together, and their gravestone read, here lies the mortal remains known to only God of a woman aged 23 to 33 and a girl aged 8 to 10. Their slain bodies were found on November 10, 1985 in Bear Brook State Park. May their souls find peace in God's loving care. The case remained cold for 15 years. In the year 2000, John Cody was a detective with the state police's major crime unit each officer in the unit was assigned two or three cold cases with the expectation they'd work on these in their spare time. Cody was assigned the Bear Brook murders. He decided to visit the area where the barrel was discovered to get a visual of the scene described in his case notes. He drove to Allenstown and hiked to the place where the barrel was found. 
He widened his perimeter to get a better sense of the area and made a startling discovery. On its side, next to a boulder partially concealed by greenery, lay a barrel identical to the one photographed in his case notes. Dark blue, 55 gallons. Cody tried to convince himself it wasn't what he feared. This was no longer possible after opening the barrel to find human remains. There were two more bodies, just 300 feet away from where the first barrel had been found 15 years earlier. The second barrel contained the partly skeletonized remains of two infants, both female, one aged one to three and the other two to four. Like the victims found in the first barrel, they had suffered severe blunt trauma to the head. There was little doubt that they had been killed by the same perpetrator or perpetrators. Investigators were also confident the second barrel had been there when the first one was discovered. This understandably led to anger in the community. Many people thought the police, both local and state, should have found the second barrel shortly after the first was discovered and the quality of the 1985 investigation was brought into question. However, at this point, it's worth considering the terrain of the Bear Brook State Park. The park is a 10,000 acre preserve. It's one of the largest state parks in New Hampshire, spanning 15 square miles and covering more than half of Allenstown. Popular public amenities such as picnic areas and an archery range are easily accessible, but other areas of the park are overrun by wild and dense woodland. 300 feet, the distance between the two barrels, is the length of a football field, not including the end zones. New York's Statue of Liberty and London's Big Ben both stand just over 300 feet. Large blue whales can weigh 150 tons and grow up to 100 feet long meaning the length of three blue whales in a line is the approximate distance between the first barrel and the second barrel. In an open space, this is not particularly far, but it's more complicated when you consider the tangled forest, swampy landscape, and all the other things that factor in between when it comes to nature. Technically, the barrels were found on a strip of private land adjacent to the park, but the area was often mistakenly used by visitors to the park such as Jesse Morgan and his friends, and the hunter that found the first barrel. So what do you think? Was the 1985 investigation subpar? Or was it an understandable error that the second barrel was missed? The only consolation for those anchored by the delay to the discovery of the second barrel is that it seems unlikely finding the second barrel in 1985 would have made much difference to the investigation because once again, investigators were unable to identify any of the victims. The victims from the first barrel were exhumed from the grave. It was later confirmed the adult victim was the mother of the oldest and youngest child victims, but not the two to four year old found in the second barrel. She became known as the middle child because of her age relative to the other child victims, not to be confused with a middle sibling because she wasn't biologically related to the others and it was unknown how she came to be with the other three victims. Radioisotope testing of the remains showed the middle child was born and grew up in a different part of the country to the other victims, but they had been together for the six months prior to their deaths. You can actually find much more information on this specific part on episode 3 of the Bear Brook podcast. Some people think the murder of Danny Paquette is a factor in why the second barrel wasn't found in 1985. On November 9, 1985, the day before the first barrel was reported, a man named Danny Paquette was welding in his backyard in Hooksit, New Hampshire, when he was shot dead. The bullet came from the woods near the house. So at first, police thought it could have been a hunting accident. However, as investigation progressed, detectives learned Paquette was a Lothario that plausibly could have had enemies. New Hampshire State Police were spread thinly dealing with two murder cases at once. At the time, New Hampshire had an average of 15 murders per year. A more cynical view is that the Bear Brook murders were deliberately neglected because the Paquette case had an identified victim and suspects with motives. It might have been considered more exciting than a case with two unknown victims. Despite initial optimism that the Paquette murder would be promptly solved, this case also went cold. And Paquette's death was largely considered a hunting accident after all rather than a premeditated killing. That was until the early 2000s after the Hooksit chief of police hired a private investigator to go back over the case. This investigator found inconsistencies in the information originally provided by Paquette's stepdaughter and the truth unraveled. 
Eric Windhurst was 17 when he shot Danny Paquette to avenge his 15-year-old friend, Melanie Paquette, who had accused her stepfather of molesting her. Windhurst was released from prison on parole in 2020 after serving 14 years inside. His original sentence was 15 to 36 years. Melanie claimed she didn't ask Windhurst to kill her stepfather, but the judge did not believe her and she was sentenced to three to six years in prison. Although the Paquette case might have initially detracted attention away from the Bearbrook murders, the Paquette case being solved after 20 years injected hope into the Bearbrook mystery. In 2009, it was given to the New Hampshire Cold Case Unit, which was formed partially because the Paquette case proved that cold cases could be solved with enough resources and personnel assigned to the job. Unfortunately, time went on with none of the four Bearbrook victims identified. In a bizarre twist of events, the killer's name would be unearthed first. On New Year's Eve 1999, Elaine Ramos hosted a party for her family and friends at her California home. She was delighted when her cousin, Yun Sun Jun, asked if she could bring a date. Both their families had immigrated to the United States from Korea when they were young. Yun Sun was in her mid-40s. Elaine thought that maybe she had struggled with dating because she often felt like an outsider in the country. Not that there's anything wrong with being single in your 40s, by the way. However, Elaine recalls that when she met Yin Sun's boyfriend, Larry Vanner, a chill ran down her back, unlike anything she'd experienced before. Elaine described Vanner as older than Yin Sun, balding on the top, scruffy brown hair on the sides, and wore a mustache and had poor personal hygiene. She said the only thing appealing about him honestly were his blue eyes. He claimed to be a retired army colonel, but snapped at Elaine for questioning him when she made polite conversation about this. He was working as a handyman when he met Yunsen. They met when she hired him to make repairs to her own house. Yunsen seemed happy, so Elaine tried to be supportive. But she and other family members raised concerns about Vanner, which led to Yunsen distancing herself from her family in 2000. She said nobody wanted her to be happy and they should just leave her alone. This was out of character for Yunsen. So her family feared Vanner was influencing her and deliberately isolating her from her loved ones. Vanner moved into Yunsen's home in Richmond, California. They got married in 2001 in an unofficial Star Trek themed ceremony held in their backyard. Elaine wasn't invited as you can imagine. Yunsen did however remain close to her friend Renee Rose. In the early summer of 2002, Yunsen didn't phone Renee when she said she would and they didn't turn up to a trip they were scheduled to take together. Renee left several voice messages for Yunsen, but only ever heard back from Vanner. He made excuses for his wife's absence, ranging from her going to stay with her ill mother to not wanting to speak to Renee anymore. Like many of Yunsen's loved ones, Renee was suspicious of Vanner. Renee told him that unless Yunsen herself said their friendship was over, she would call the police. And that's exactly what she did. Vanner was eventually brought in for questioning. Rox Ann Grunheed was a detective on the case. She said initially the police only wanted to speak to him to confirm Yunsen was safe, but they became suspicious when his story kept changing regarding her whereabouts. Suspicions increased when a search of his name and birth date only brought up an index number. These are assigned to people without valid ID. He was fingerprinted, and this resulted in his previous criminal activity coming to light, as well as other fake names, including Gerald Mockerman and Curtis Kimball. Kimball was the earliest name on record. In 1989, he was charged with child abandonment. He spent 18 months in a California state prison. He left town on the day he was released, violating his parole, and presumably taking on a new identity. Police searched Yunsen's home. They found a waist-high pile of cat litter in a basement crawl space in the garage where Yunsen worked on her pottery, one of her passions. Forensics uncovered a mummified foot wearing a flip-flop within the litter. Yunsen's dismembered body was soon found after. She had been bludgeoned to death and suffered blunt force trauma to the head. Grunheed confirmed with a local pet store that a man matching Vanner's description had purchased a large amount of cat litter 
Vanner has told a neighbor he was dealing with a rat infestation so not to worry if they smelled anything unusual. In November 2002, Vanner was arrested for Jensen's murder. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison the following year after pleading guilty to the horrific act of violence. He died in prison of natural causes in December 2010. This meant he wasn't alive when his real identity was eventually uncovered or when further crimes surfaced. Roxanne Grunied thinks Vanner might have pleaded guilty to discourage her from digging deeper into his past. But she wasn't discouraged, and this led to shocking discoveries. Investigators had a nagging feeling that the daughter Vanner was imprisoned for abandoning in the 80s might not have been his biological child after all. After ordering the completion of a DNA test that was left unfinished in the 80s, the results confirmed the suspicions investigators held. Vanner and the child were not blood related. In 1986, Vanner, who was then going by the name of Gordon Jensen, arrived at a holiday host RV park in California with a five-year-old girl he claimed was his daughter. He said her name was Lisa. Richard and Catherine Decker were an elderly couple staying at the park at the time. They befriended Gordon and Lisa, and they played with their grandson all the time when he was visiting. Richard and Catherine became worried for Lisa when they noticed she was getting very thin. She also seemed somewhat neglected and she didn't have any toys. However, they felt sorry for Gordon, who claimed Lisa's mother died, leaving him a single parent. He cried to the Deckers over his alleged bereavement, and they had no reason to not believe him. Gordon admitted he was finding it difficult to cope with Lisa on his own. The Deckers suggested their adult daughter and her husband could adopt Lisa as they were struggling to have a child of their own. Gordon agreed to a trial adoption, so the Deckers took Lisa to San Bernardino to introduce her to their daughter and her husband. It was when Lisa was away from Gordon and solely in their care that they noticed signs of abuse and Lisa spoke about how Gordon had mistreated her. Details about the abuse Lisa suffered are limited, but it seems probable that she was molested. The Deckers went to the police. Gordon Jensen had left the RV park by this time and any details he had given about himself turned out to be false. A fingerprint pulled from his abandoned vehicle led to the match with a Curtis Kimball, who had previously been arrested for drunk driving with Lisa in the car. However, this was also a dead end because no concrete identity documents were attached to that name either. Every time one identity would be unmasked, it was like he was wearing another mask underneath. This is how he would later become known as the Chameleon Killer. Lisa was then taken into foster care. She had not been officially adopted by the Deckers, so they were not able to keep her. She was later adopted by a different family. In 1988, the police tracked down Curtis Kimball by chance after he was arrested in San Luis Obispo in California for stealing a car. He said his name was Gerald Mockerman, but his fingerprints were a match for Curtis Kimball, a man wanted for child molestation and abandonment. In 1989, Kimball accepted a plea deal. He pled guilty to the child abandonment charges and in return, the molestation and vehicular charges were dropped. The authorities had concerns that Lisa might have been kidnapped and wasn't in fact Kimball's daughter. A blood sample then had been taken from Lisa, but as mentioned earlier, the paternity test wasn't completed at this time. A blood sample was never taken from Kimball. The reason for this is entirely unknown, but some have speculated the plea deal closed the case and it was subsequently forgotten. It's frustrating because had the paternity test been completed, Kimball would have been facing kidnap charges. This could have put a dangerous man behind bars for a significant length of time instead of a meager 18 months. Grunheed's 2003 discovery that Lisa wasn't Vanner's biological child prompted a lot of questions about her actual identity. Investigators contacted the San Bernardino authorities because they had jurisdiction over Lisa's case. It must have been a shock for Lisa to discover at 22 years old that her name was not Lisa and her father was actually not her father. The investigation into our identity went nowhere because Kimball, now in prison for murder of Yun Sun Jun, refused to provide any information on how Lisa came to be in his care. 
Ten years later, when Lisa was 32 years old, Detective Headley took over the case. All his leads went nowhere until Lisa herself suggested sending her DNA to a genealogy website. They connected with distant relatives online, but these people turned out to be too far removed to know anything about Lisa or her parents. In desperation, Headley contacted a not-for-profit organization called DNAadoption.com that helped adopted children find their biological parents. This is how Headley met Barbara Raventer. She initially began studying genealogy as a hobby in retirement, but with talent and hard work, she rose to become a leading name in the field. Together with Headley and a growing number of volunteers, including some of Lisa's distant relatives, Barbara Raventer followed the branches of Lisa's family tree, asking possible relatives to be tested until they got to the root. It took over a year, around 100 volunteers and approximately 10,000 hours of work, but they found the name of Lisa's mother. Initially, Headley was disheartened because a search of the police database suggested this woman didn't exist. It turned out she didn't show up in police records because she had been inactive on voting and driving databases for a long time. This is because she went missing in 1981. After speaking to relatives that remembered Lisa, she finally discovered her birth name, Don Budin. Her mother, Denise Budin, disappeared from New Hampshire shortly after Thanksgiving with baby Don and her boyfriend who went by the name of Robert Bob Evans. This was another alias for the man who also used the names Curtis Kimball and Gordon Jensen. We don't know for sure that Kimball killed Denise Budin, but unfortunately it seems likely considering she's been missing for so long and became separated from Lisa and Kimball was and Kimball has a track record of violence against women and children. Lisa has asked for privacy amid the attention around Kimball's crimes, but we know she's married with three children and in a statement released by the police on her behalf, she is said to be living a happy and secure life. For the purposes of this video, I'll call her Lisa to avoid confusion. I'm not sure what name she goes by now and I haven't tried to find out in respect to her privacy. If it wasn't for Lisa's friendship with the Deckers, it's possible she wouldn't be alive today. What's even more disturbing is that when five-year-old Lisa was asked if she had any brothers or sisters, she replied that she did, but they died from eating grass mushrooms when they went camping. These siblings she referred to might not have been biological siblings or have existed at all. We'll probably never know for certain, but it's a chilling indication that there could have been more victims out there yet to be discovered. In a press conference in 2017, Jeff Strelzen, a prosecutor from the New Hampshire Attorney General's office, announced that the man responsible for Yun Sun Jun's murder and the abandonment of five-year-old Lisa was also the biological father of the middle child in the Bear Brook case, the totter found in the second barrel who wasn't related to the other three victims. This discovery came about because investigators now knew Denise Budin went missing from New Hampshire in 1981 and the first barrel was discovered in 1985. DNA tests were undertaken to find out if Denise was the adult victim. It was not her, but the connection between Denise Budin and Robert Evans slash Curtis Kimball led to another DNA test that found Kimball was the biological father of the middle child. All four Bear Brook victims were still unidentified at this point, but detectives were closing in on the killer. Kimball died in prison in 2010, so couldn't be questioned, but more connections between him and the Bear Brook murders would soon come to light. Remarkably, helping Lisa discover her birth name wasn't where Barbara Ray Venter's involvement in this case ended, but also used her genealogy talents to uncover the birth name of the Chameleon Killer. Her work in general has proven groundbreaking in recent years. She has successfully found killers and victims from cold cases where investigators had the DNA of the person they wanted to identify. Most genealogy websites currently aim to keep law enforcement out for data protection reasons. However, others such as GEDmatch are open to being used to solve crimes. The chameleon killer never uploaded his DNA online, but his relatives did. Even if it was a distant relative who uploaded their DNA to one of these websites, as we saw in Lisa's case, this could be used to trace closer relatives. Lisa's case took around 10,000 hours to crack. In contrast, it took Ray Venter just 10 hours to track down the chameleon killer. The man that went by Gordon Jensen, Curtis Kimball, Bob Evans, Gerald Mockersman, as well as many, 
other aliases, had four children whilst going by his birth name. A DNA test from one of his daughters finally confirmed his identity. Over 30 years after the first barrel was found, his name was Terry Peter Rasmussen. Born in 1943, Terry Rasmussen grew up in Arizona and Colorado. He joined the Navy in 1961, where he trained as an electrician. He served for six years, then left the Navy and worked in his parents' shoe shop in Hawaii. He married in 1968 and moved to Arizona. Twin girls were the first of four children he had with his wife. The marriage broke down when the twins were around six years old. His children rarely saw their father after their parents split and Rasmussen moved away. He turned up unexpectedly a few months after the split with a woman, but being so young, his children were unable to really give many details about her, if any at all. It's possible she was the adult victim from the first barrel or the mother of the middle child. Unfortunately, the DNA of the Bear Brook victims was too degraded for the same method of genealogy tracing that uncovered Rasmussen's identity to work, but Ray Venter and her team were not giving up quite yet. Rebecca Heath, who usually goes by Becky, spends most of her free time web sleuthing. She investigates mysteries and missing persons cases by scouring online message boards, especially forums where family members post about loved ones that are either officially missing or with whom they've lost touch. Interested in the Bear Brook murders, Becky decided to search the web for family members that might have posted about the victims. She focused on the late 70s and early 80s as this is the period in which the younger victims were born and then later went missing. Anyone that had been seen after 1985 could essentially be ruled out. She also focused on posts from people based in New Hampshire and California as this is where Terry Rasmussen is known to have spent a lot of his time. It definitely wasn't easy work because posts were often out of date, either because the OP, original poster, didn't provide an update when the person they were seeking was found, or their contact details had expired. Becky felt like she was closing in on something important when she found a message posted in 2000 from someone looking for their half-sister who was born in California in the mid-70s. The writer said they had told the parents of her half-sister were dead, Knowing Rasmussen had lied about people being deceased in the past, Becky decided to search for an official record confirming their mother's death, a record she couldn't find. In 2003, a man commented on the post saying he was trying to find his sister who had two children when they lost touch. He was wondering if the OP's half-sister could be one of the children. In 2014, someone else commented saying they believed the mother was her missing sister. This was a missing family whose ages and timelines matched the Bear Brook victims. Becky posted about this in a Facebook group for the Bear Brook mystery in 2017, but her post didn't get much interest or response, so she just let it go. But later after listening to the Bear Brook podcast, she had a gut feeling that she had been on to something before. So she went back to the forum and contacted the family. One family member mentioned the mother had been married to a man named Rasmussen. She couldn't remember the man's first name, but thought it may have been Terry. This was after Terry Rasmussen had been announced as the suspected killer of the Bear Brook victims. This tied the missing mother to the Bear Brook case. Not wanting to share her suspicions with the family in case she was wrong, Becky contacted Detective Headley in October of 2018. Around the same time, Barbara Ray Venter was making groundbreaking progress with the hair of the Bearbrook victims. She was testing autosomal DNA, which is found inside the nucleus of a cell, and it had previously been considered impossible to recover autosomal DNA from strands of hair that were no longer attached to the root because DNA inside the hair root cells shatter when it becomes part of the strand. But through trial and error, Ray Venter and her colleagues were actually able to resemble that broken autosomal DNA found in the rootless hair of the victims. Her work confirmed Becky Heath's theory and the victims were finally named. The mother, Marilise Elizabeth Honeychurch, was in her mid-twenties when she died. She was born in Connecticut in 1954. Her sisters remember her as bubbly and quirky with a good sense of humor. She married twice before meeting Terry Rasmussen and had a daughter with each husband. One of her sisters said she was excited to be a mother and loved her children dearly. 
Marilise went missing around Thanksgiving in 1978 after introducing Terry to her family at her mother's home in California. Her family think that there had been an argument between Marilise and her mother about Terry's suitability as a partner. After this, they never heard from Marilise again. It sounds eerily like what happened with Yun Sun Jun and her family. All this evidence suggests Rasmussen was a physically and emotionally abusive partner that isolated his victims from their family. Marilise's eldest daughter, Marie Vaughn, is believed to have been between 6 and 8 at her time of death, and Marilise's youngest daughter, Sarah McWaters, was possibly as young as 11 months when she died. Becky Heath stayed in touch with Marilise's family. She said it was heartbreaking seeing photographs of Marilise and her daughters. The composite sketches were close, despite the artist having so little to go on. So we need to pay attention to the composite sketch of the middle child. Unfortunately, the middle child, Rasmussen's biological daughter, is still unidentified. We hope that one day, she can be named and her identity can be returned to her. She could have family out there waiting for news of their missing loved one. New Hampshire police encourage anyone with information to please come forward. She is believed to have been between two and four years of age at the time of her death. She was likely Caucasian with a small amount of Asian, African, and or American Indian ancestry. She had slightly wavy brown hair and an overbite, which might have been noticeable. She was possibly anemic. Genealogy studies and knowledge of Rasmussen's timeline suggest she was likely born in Texas, but might have been born in California or Arizona. She and her mother possibly have family in Mississippi, specifically Pearl River County. As mentioned earlier, there are fears that Don Budin and the middle child's mother could be other victims. We can only hope that the new information will surface in the future. I will keep you updated if I hear anything. The last major update in this case was the identification of Marilise Honeychurch and her two daughters, which happened recently in 2019. So there is a chance further developments could emerge over time. Other possible victims are the siblings Lisa mentioned and unidentified woman found in an abandoned refrigerator in and an unidentified woman found in an abandoned refrigerator in 1995 in San Joaquin County, California. The woman suffered blunt force trauma to the head and the way the body was dumped resembles the Bear Brook barrels to some extent. The fridge contained a brand of milk that was only delivered in an area Rasmussen was known to be at the time. Former San Joaquin County Sheriff Assistant John Huber believes Rasmussen might be responsible for the woman's death, but it will be difficult to say with any degree of certainty unless she is identified. We might never know how many people Rasmussen actually murdered. I'll post a follow-up video if I hear any significant developments. And with that, once again, we come to the end of another video. Thank you guys so much for supporting the swamp the way you do. I couldn't do this without you. I'd love to know your thoughts on this case down below. What do you think really went down? How many people did Terry Rasmussen actually kill? And are all these victims his or are they just coincidental? Please be sure to slap that like button as it helps me out a ton. Subscribe to the channel if you're new as I upload videos like this almost every single day. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please be sure to give us a 5 star rating over there as it helps us grow on those platforms. If you have a story or a case you would like to suggest, be sure to comment them down below or send them in at swampdweller.net and I'll see you all soon with another creepy video.